Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have been having way too much fun behind the scenes here trying to get on uh, to the episode, which is why we're all laughing and smiling right now. But we have two wonderfully amazing guests who we have wanted to have on for a while. We have the incredible Lindsay with an E, Williams. Hello, Lindsay. How are you? Hi. I'm amazing. Thank you. <laughs> she Welcome, is Lindsay amazing with an, e. <laughs> with an E. And we have the wonderful Chad Harris with the grooviest background I've ever seen. How are you today, Chad? Chad? Today. Yep. I'm doing yeah. awesome. Celebrating science. <laughs> this is the telescope. Yeah, good stuff. It's yeah, I, I love celebrating those science. Them up. Yeah, <laughs> we love it. Now, I will say to our viewers that the Lindsay and Chad probably look familiar. You're probably right now going, I know I've seen them. I know I already like them. I know I've seen them. <laughs> Lindsay and Chad are from uh, Landon. Let's pull up our graphic here. The recently released documentary. See, now everyone's going, oh, yeah. Shiny, happy oh, people, yeah. Duggar family secrets. <laughs> That's right. Lindsay and Chad. Stars. Yeah, a movie star. I kind of <laughs> feel like that. Like, I can't believe we're actually talking to them. I can't believe I saw them on my TV. And now here they are, and we get to communicate. So, these two wonderful people were part of this documentary, which, you know, started out kind of telling us more about the Duger family, if you're familiar with TLC and 19 Kids and Counting, you know, that it's all very interesting, their story and, and the things that happened. But as we all watched the documentary, especially as post-Mormons, it was a four um, episode documentary, we started to feel that we'd seen this story before because we started talking, they started giving us information about the organization that the Duggars were a part of. And this is called the IBLP, a religious organization. And if you're like me, you were checking off boxes. Oh my gosh, this is the same. I, I'm, this is so familiar. So we thought that this conversation needs to um, continue. I had the opportunity to interview Lindsay on John DeLynn's um, program a few weeks ago with some of the other survivors. And it was just wonderful. And I thought we need to just, we need to talk to all of these guys because we're like cousins. We're, we're like uh, stepbrothers and sisters, you know, a lot of shared experiences. So I think we'll start out today, um, whichever one of you would like to take it, explain to us exactly what this organization is, and then tell us how each of you, uh, arrived to be raised in it. <laughs> Take it away, Chad. Okay. Take it away, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the Institute in Basic Life Principles is a religious institution that was started by a man named Bill Gothard uh, back in the 60s and 70s. At that time, it was known as the Institute in Basic Youth Conflicts. Uh, Gothard used uh, the uh, Institute as a bit of a platform for his message that the reason America was having all sorts of societal upheavals in the 60s and 70s wasn't because of longstanding you know, civil rights issues or issues with feminism uh, or the lack thereof. It was about authority. You know, America needed to go back to to, you know, making authority front and center. And so from there, he expanded uh, his reach as his audiences grew. He took a little traveling seminar with him all over the country. As his audiences grew, he expanded that into what was what became known as the Institute in Basic Life Principles, which branched out into several different areas, uh, a lot of areas of influence in the uh, American evangelical uh, community as a whole. But most notably, and this is where Lindsay and I come in, uh, a homeschooling branch known as the Advanced Training Institute of America, or ATIA. And that was simply a a little bit of a grift for uh, Bill Gothard to get his uh, teachings into people's homes directly and to have children homeschooled, which in the 80s and 90s was a pretty radical concept. Um, he was uh, getting uh, children homeschooled in his teachings from birth, of which, you know, had authority as the base, but all also a whole bunch of other teachings that were very uh, authoritarian based and very um, had a lot of ties to shame and a lot of ties to, uh, well, what essentially was religious and emotional abuse. And there were lofty goals, as I said, you know, in the trailer and the documentary, world do domination was the goal. Uh, we were taught You don't get much more lofty than that. <laughs> pretty much. I mean, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> Gothard taught parents that their children would learn enough from this institute and from the uh, Advanced Training Institute to become the next generation of Christian Marines, as it were, to uh, bring a wave of uh, religious revival into America and thereby change the world for Jesus. 
And my folks brought, bought into that. Uh, they bought into the Quiverful movement, which was very closely related to uh, ATI, in which parents were challenged to have as many children as possible. Uh, they were first convinced into that. And then from there, they were convinced to go into the uh, ATI homeschooling program themselves when I was about seven years old. And from age seven until I graduated high school, I was a part of these teachings and I deeply regret ever having been part of it because uh, it, it was, in fact, I experienced a lot of abuse, physical, emotional, spiritual, and what have you. And I've spent pretty much my, half my adult life uh, telling people about the Institute, what its goals are and how it needs to stop. Wow. Having a lot of kids, that's craziness you're talking there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, it is so funny. I didn't even think about this parallel in teaching. Um, there's, there's a concept in Mormonism where, you know, we've been saved to these last days. We are the ones mm -hmm. that are going to make this happen. We are going to usher in the dispensation of Christ. And they've been telling people that the last days have been pretty much for the last couple hundred years, but this concept that you are so special and your children, Children are so special, the spirits that you bring to earth, and you have this incredible purpose. You're beyond any other human being. So, and, and to have as many children as possible for that reason, the righteous generation. We have songs about it. We, you know, all that. We have kids that march around singing songs like that. It's so similar. Ugh. So, and, Lindsay, and tell us how. Oh, go ahead, Landon. I was going to say, now you just realized that it was really how they get you know, more people into the program. Obviously, yeah. the more kids you have, the more homeschooling you need. And in, in, in our church, uh, the, the wow. more tithe payers, the more missionaries you have, the more people yeah. you have as you, if, if the people have more kids. So yeah, it's definitely yeah. very the much more the people, more. the further the reach. Yeah, yep. that is a great way to say it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Lindsay, now tell us your experience because you, your family, you were not born into it. You joined. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. My family joined in. I was eight years old in 1986. Uh, my belief at this point is that my parents were already, they were already attending seminars in like 84, 85. Like they already knew it was like IBYC and then it became IBLP, but it was an institute in basic youth conflicts because Bill started it out with like uh, prison systems and young people and, you know, uh, like, what do you call it? Like just youth groups and stuff at churches and things like that. And so like inner city kids and things like that. So it did morph into IBLP, the Institute in Basic Life Principles, because that's easy for everybody. It's basic. And <laughs> so I've always found some of his wording to be so odd. And yet it rolls off the tongue so easily. You don't realize kind of like, so it, underneath the Institute in Basic Life Principles, he had two seminars, the basic seminar and the advanced seminar. I mean, it's so simplistic. And yet you're like, oh, I'm going to the advanced seminar. And you're just like, okay, words. Um, and so anyway, he for my family, that's how my parents started going to the basic and advanced seminars. And even at that younger age, my parents were already starting to take things kind of away from me because they would go to these seminars, learn more about how to be more godly and more restrictive because, you know, the world bad, Christian's good. So uh, things were just getting very quickly kind of like removed. Like you can't play with these toys anymore. You can't have these TV shows. Oh, the, the TV gets wheeled out of the house. Like any kind of entertainment or anything like that is gone. And the kind of friends you can have, they're starting to really question it at the age of eight. They're questioning who my friends are. And you're like, wow. Okay. Um, anyway, so then they got into the homeschooling program as well. I know that they wanted to get in earlier, but, um, I think we were just really young. I don't think they were quite ready yet. And honestly, the, the program, the advanced training Institute homeschooling program started only two years prior. So we were getting in at like year three, I think is when we got involved, but it, getting in like the grassroots movement on something I don't always think is the best idea, especially when it's educational curriculum for your children. Um, so I went from public school in third grade, I was pulled out and put into the homeschooling program. And that's where the line in the documentary where I'm like, what in the honky tonk is going on here? Because <laughs> like we were in our basement and we had like milk cartons stacked on top of each other with like a press board and some contact paper on it. And that was my desk. And we're like sitting in the basement. And I'm just like, this is not normal. Like this is not how this just because you had been in regular school. Right, you knew. I had, I you know were old how enough to understand. Go. I know how. I know, and that's the difference we're, there. Yes. Um, I think like Landon and I were raised in it so but i was much like you and mormons there's there's different levels my parents were sure. very orthodox we did not have tv you know it mm -hmm. was that we didn't have tv and you know definitely the control <clears throat> over you know what you read or what you learned that kind of thing and especially at church too i remember going to a young 
women, young men activity. And we were supposed to bring our records that might be satanic oh, and, and yeah. burn actually a, a fire. Yes, yes. This was in the eighties. Yes. For those of our viewers in Mormonish that says, oh, that doesn't happen in the seventies and eighties, this did happen. I have been to a bonfire. So. Oh yeah. It <laughs> was a bonfires idea. were a big deal. Yeah. Bonfires yeah. were huge. Yes, and it was that I remember rooting them. out the evil in a very yeah. dramatic way. Did you, Chad, did you ever ha have anything you had to burn? Please tell me about bonfires, Chad. <laughs> oh, oh quite okay, a few. Good. yes. Good. Anything that was remotely considered to be demonic and everything was somehow had a nexus to demon activity or Satan. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Disney yeah, films. Yeah. Yeah. Disney yeah. films were interesting. Uh, yeah. Because I had an older brother who was a golden child. He was allowed to keep most of his, but there were a few that didn't feed the fire. I will say <laughs> one thing that, you know, probably um, not a lot of people experienced in their lives, but in a lot of uh, ATI and IBLP homes they did was Calvin and Hobbes comics. Oh, yeah. Um, they they believed that Hobbes, since he was a stuffed tiger who would only, uh, you know, be real or you know appear to be real whenever uh, Calvin's parents were around, was indicative of a demon that circumvented parental authority mm -hmm. and influenced children to do evil. So uh, they literally burned all the Calvin and Hobbes comic books I had as a kid, and because I. You know, I was still around when um, when they were in the paper. They would staple paper over the comics on Sundays and everything, so I could not read them. Oh, so wow. that was that was the extent of it. They they went all out. Yeah. Were, were your parents? Well, what, were your? Did they encourage stay at home moms, or how how yes. were your parents there then that they could just take this over and do this? Well, I, they, well, yeah. Go ahead, Chad. Go ahead. Yeah, my dad, uh, and this was actually covered in one of their um, one, one of their uh, financial uh, books uh, called the Men's Manual, um, which you know men were supposed to you know run the homes and run the finances and everything. Of course. And a big yeah exactly, oh, and a big Where's section, <laughs> <laughs> and a big section of uh, of the Men's Manual was warnings on uh, what happens when a woman works outside the home, and men were absolutely directly encouraged, you know, to keep their wives a home uh, and all their um, all their female assigned female at birth uh, family members home. Um, their daughters basically were not allowed to seek employment outside the house. They had to wait until, you know, they were married and they would, you know, stay in the home until, you know, the right uh, man came along, quote unquote, to uh, court them and such. So it was very male centric, very patriarchal. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, one thing that that resonated, I think, with everybody that, that I talked to was the umbrella idea with the hierarchy of where the authority was. Maybe you, I wish we had a graphic on that, but I think you can explain it because to Mormons, we have this exact same. It's not the shape of an umbrella, but it is this authoritative diagram that just absolutely mm -hmm. explains what you just said. Yeah. It basically just puts God at the very top and he's the largest umbrella. Then underneath that umbrella, you have the parents and then in a smaller or the father then underneath that when you have the smaller one that even smaller so it just keeps reducing like an inverted triangle um and you've got the father then the mother and sometimes if it's expounded then you'll have the children in their own little umbrella but sometimes it's just like it's like three umbrellas so god father father and mother um but it basically <laughs> puts all of the onus like on the father to lead the home but then the mother to take care of the rest of it. So the father, I always felt like the father gets like the glory moment, you know, like I get to pay yeah. for my children and I get to go out and work in the forest. And then everybody else just gets to stay isolated because God forbid they have any flavor or inkling of the outside world because then they're all going to be tainted. Um, and so then it's up to the mother to quite literally do everything else, um, which I, and do it joyfully and happily, and then yeah. be available when your husband comes home and do that joyfully and happily, and then get up in five in the morning and do it all over again every day and homeschool your children and do all the lesson yeah. planning. And I mean, it is, it is brutal on stay at home moms, especially the ones that are also having to just like keep on pulling out the kids, you know, <laughs> popping those out, you know, incessantly. And, um, it's, I was, I don't know if I would even say lucky, but I only had three kids in my family. So I, we didn't have additional, my parents tried for a little while, but, um, that just wasn't in the cards. And, um, I'm actually really glad because I just, I can't imagine, I see all these big families and I can't imagine what it, that must've been like on top of all of the other abuse and trauma that was going on. And another yeah, thing another about pressure. the, uh, yeah, another thing Go about ahead. the umbrella too, that was, that was a huge control 
uh, portion of IBLP was this idea that, you know, anyone who is under the umbrella was under the authority of, you know, the levels above them. So at any point, if you stepped out from under the umbrella, uh, there was, you know, the way it was explained to us was there was this constant barrage of, you know, fiery darts from Satan, metaphorically, that if you stepped out from under any of these coverings of authority, you would immediately suffer dire consequences. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we were encouraged as children, you know, and, and of course, women under their husbands and husbands under God, which let's face it was technically Bill Gothard. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, if anybody stepped out from any of these instructions or did something contrary to what their authorities wanted, they, you know, they had this constant fear and threat that horrible things would befall them. Gothard yeah. would, you know, constantly tell all these unsourced stories about, you know, people getting sick, leading to financial ruin, even death for, you know, even daring to question their authority figures. Yeah. Wow, yeah, we get that as people that have left the church. Um, everybody's like, oh. Uh... You know, no one would ever look at a success that you have. They ignore that. But should you have a normal life scenario that isn't the greatest, then it's like, ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys get that kind of, I mean, well, first of all, are you in contact with anybody that's still in, or is it sort of like post-Mormons where it's a very dicey relationship and sometimes you're totally cut off. Sometimes you're, I mean, how does that, how does that work when you step away? Is it a clean cut? Are you still connected i think it it varies uh, across many spectrums right. i think um yeah that's a heavy one because i feel <laughs> it like heavy, it's sorry. not like all, it's not like you just get completely shunned immediately by like the whole of everything it's right. you might have some people like well it didn't seem like what they did was really that bad like i don't think they're that like i'm still going to be their friend but then the longer you stay out of it and don't like come back into the fold, um, then you definitely, even if there's no proof of this idea that like, oh, Satan's got a hold on them, that is their preconceived notion. And so they will believe it. You are just not under your umbrella. Like when I first got married, I, I started modeling um, a few years into me getting married. And I had people that were basically saying like, we can't, we, we just, we're having a hard time with what you're doing, but we really just do not respect your husband. So it, in, in essence, they were saying that my you. above, my above umbrella was allowing me to sin mm. and be out there in the wild. And I was just like, hold on. First of all, you don't even understand what the real world is. So you can you are speaking from complete ignorance. Like we're a partnership or we don't even have umbrellas, but we're standing next to each other and he's supporting me and I'm doing what I would like to do. But I also had my own defaults where I would make sure he was okay with what I was doing. But I know I had a, I had a wild enough spirit that I probably would have done it anyway. <laughs> but I was just like, I, but I still would default and be like, Hey, are you okay if I'm doing this? You know? And he's like, yeah, do what you want to do. But then we started, I started to lose more female friends because they were just like, Oh, like you're, I was just completely out there sinning and be, can't becoming a lust for men and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, y'all need to really take a chill pill. It's just, I cannot live a life where my being has to be responsible for everybody else's thoughts and actions and attitudes and behaviors. Like this is so asinine to put that kind of pressure. And in the long run, it creates a lot of other systemic issues with your nervous system, your physical body, like everything else. And, um, with my family, I think because we were family, they, sort of just stayed within like well you're our daughter we're gonna hold on to that and they love my husband because he's basically the perfect saint of the, the planet but <laughs> i always feel like they liked him better so they were just like well we'll keep we'll keep, we'll keep her husband around <laughs> because but, we uh, like him so yeah, are they all still part of the religion and part of the program everyone my, in your family my or? family is none of them really practice anymore my brothers are definitely out of it um they okay. don't homeschool they don't go to church or anything like that um i would say that we, when it comes to my parents it's more like they want to toe the line of our education <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, our homeschooling as the reason that we're all so successful or that these things are going well for us because, oh, we learned godly character. Um, and I get really frustrated with that. I'm like, you have no idea what you did to me that I've had to undo for myself to become the confident person I am because I was, I had a, an independent frustrated spirit, but I definitely was not confident. Um, my mother still goes to church from what I understand. I've been estranged with her for over a year and a half. My, my father with uh, in a year now, I've been estranged from him as well by my my choice. Um, and then kind of also theirs. Um, so it's, I just had to get to the point where I said, you know, my health and safety, my mental
mental safety and well-being was far more important than relationships that couldn't prove they had unconditional love. Love in the ATI system is very reward based. And if you don't if you don't do the certain things and perform like you should as a circus animal, then you do not get rewarded with the love peanuts. <laughs> and so it's just like I can't do it anymore. I'm 45 years old. I have to go and truly live and not be anchored to the expectations of my parents that are completely misguided. Um, other other extended family members, um, in laws and stuff, are still actually in the program. So it's a it's a very sensitive situation with that. But it keeps my ear to the ground a little bit because I am able to see just how entrenched they still are, even with everything bill being outed and everything else and the signs, the writings literally on the wall that this is just disintegrating in front of their eyes and yet they still are holding on to the principles because it's just the root of life for them it's sad and it's what they've always done i mean it's, it's what they've always known and we have a, a phrase people will say about post-mormons they'll say well you left it but you can't leave it alone you know mm. and that's not it it is ear to the ground because you still have family that are there yeah. you have to understand what's going on you're still completely impacted by it there are things that your family members are rituals and things they're participating in that yeah. you're left out of you know you're still in it so what about your family chad uh or, or if if you're not comfortable talking i know i'm just throwing these questions out here that's you right. can just say that's enough. <laughs> no, seriously, reclaiming it's... my time. <laughs> I know I don't want to get anybody, you know, any hate mail or anything. So no, it's fine. Uh, yeah, my family. Um, yeah, they also are not part of IBLP now, but they're very sympathetic for the most part to IBLP. And refuse to uh, consider it in anything but a positive light. Now, IBLP spanned across Christian denominations. There was, wasn't really one church uh, that you could really say that this was tied to. There were Presbyterians, there were Baptists, there were Mennonites involved, brethren, you name it. Now, uh, for my part, my dad was an independent fundamental Baptist preacher. And um, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, you know, is very compatible with uh, IBLP because of a lot of, you know, their shared teachings and views on authority. So my folks are still very much involved in the IFB church, which, you know, if to really dig into one aspect of fundamentalism and to figure out why it's wrong, kind of brings down the entire house of cards. And my family, for the most part, won't do that. And as for, you know, a lot of the friends I grew up with and people who are still involved in the IFB church, I'm pretty sure my face is on several wanted posters in the IFB church uh, across the country. So, uh, yeah, the, we just do not have contact for everyone's safety. You are on every <laughs> prayer bulletin. <laughs> have you seen this man? Please help him. That's right. There you go. Even if you haven't, pray for this guy. <laughs> I mean, IBLP is on my wanted poster, so, you know, we're even. <laughs> fair. Only fair. Oh, my gosh. Landon, I think you had a question. Sorry, I was cutting, you, cutting my feed was cutting in and out no i i uh i i was trying to see if my microphone was working now can you hear me now <laughs> a little yes. bit better yeah oh, okay. So. okay no uh it, it's just amazing how how close they that related it is to the lds that it was the same mm -hmm. way uh and and as Lindsay mentioned when she left the church that was one of the, that was the question i was going to ask is uh how uh did you how hard was it to leave? Because that, that's one of the things with high demand religions or making it a cult is how easy is it for you to leave? Can you just walk away and everyone says, oh, sorry, we missed you, you know, or do they, you know, go after you and in some way try to bring you back and 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 not let you make that clean mm -hmm. split? Mm -hmm. um, most people in IBLP are passive or passive aggressive. So what it's not like people came storming at my door saying, get back to the church or get back to your belief system. Cause IBLP again, it's, I, I know it's different for all of us, but IBLP isn't a church. The, the, um, the belief is Christian as it, as its foundation, but, but as far as the organization organization is concerned, like you, you get pressure from the people that are your friends or a little bit of pressure from your family. Like, are you sure you want to model? Like, I don't know. It just doesn't seem very modest, you know, but then that's kind of just all it or like the passive aggressive, like, oh, were you, did you guys go to church today? And you're just like, no. Oh, well you need to find, I really hope and praying that you find a family church. You can find a home church where you are. And you're just like, keep praying because <laughs> it's not happening for me. It was, it was actually really easy to not get up on Sunday morning and go to church. I, since I was probably 12, I hated the morning ritual of getting ready to go to church. 
it absolutely graded against everything within myself. Um, I was just talking about this with Chad the other day where it's like, I just got into such a heavy amount of imposter syndrome that I just, it was like, this is just what you have to do to survive. And I didn't even think of it as survival. It's like, this is just what you do because if you try to be anything else or say, I don't know if I understand God, like he doesn't, I don't hear him and I'm, he doesn't answer my prayers and I'm in a lot of abuse at home. You, you are not, you're going to get, you know, kind of come down on by your parents, you know, how dare you? And you just, after a while, you just kind of like acquiesce to it. You're like, well, this is just reality. Um, so for all of those years and even working at headquarters with Bill Gothard and everything else, like I always had a firm belief in my own head that I just didn't think God was a real thing. And I, he never proved himself to me. He never showed himself. And I was constantly bumbling into other bad situations and I know now it's because of my na naivety, my conditioning, uh, the indoctrination. And I'm just trying to like toe the line and follow what I'm told. And yet at no point does this feel happy? Does this feel safe? Do I feel protected? So when I got married, I am one of the very, very, very few. And I recognize this heavily. I'm very privileged to have married a man who felt the way I did. Because that is intensely rare in ATI to find another ATI student who was also homeschooled and everything who was like, you know, I'm not really like jiving with this either. Like I was like, are you okay if I wear pants? Are you okay if I wear shorts? Are you okay if we don't have kids for the first five months or five years? Are you okay if I'm not really sure if I want to go to church at some point? Are you okay if I color my hair? Are you okay if I wear jewelry? Are you okay if I put on nail polish? Like I just went through a barrage of questions for him privately on a phone call. And he was like, you can be you. And I was like, but dude, you know how this goes. Bill toes the line that if you do not repair your relationship with your father and like totally have this like amazing love relationship with daddy, then you will marry someone who is just like him. So that until you learn the lessons you're supposed to. So I had a very big fear of like, how do you even escape when I am not resolving with my father? Like that abuse was too much. So no, he doesn't get to have that from me. But then I had this intense fear that I meet a nice guy, but like, I already know what Bill Gothard says is going to happen, but then I don't really believe in God. So how, what does this look like? So I just kept trying to take the steps. And when we got married, just slowly, I refused to live anywhere near his parents. I refused that we live anywhere near mine. So we went <laughs> far away and we just started living a life. Now, to me, the hardest part, Landon, was actually not, not the leaving. I was sad that some of my friends didn't want to like accept me as the person I was becoming, which was a terrifying free woman <laughs> for them. But I, I was more scared of how in the hell I was supposed to work with the rest of the world, because that was the complete unknown for me. And I'm like, y'all are noise. You're boring. I know your story. You're stuck. It's okay. Do you do you, but I want to go out and be a successful human being. And I'm curious about the world and the planet. And that was actually the gut punch that I've just had over and over again for 23 years. Like, I feel like every every week I'm still learning something I didn't know. And it, that's always being thrown back in my face by the world, not intentionally, but like maybe I don't know a band member's name or I don't know some movie reference or a celebrity or whatever it might be. And you're just like, oh, will this ever be over? Will I ever know everything I'm, I missed in the 20 years I was in a bunker? I don't know if I will. Um, so that was harder for me than actually the leaving and people trying to toe the line of come back. I'm like, no, I've spent enough time there. I'm sorry. Yeah, that I was think so you long, start but... to, you start, no, no, you start to recognize, no, because all this is going to resonate. Uh, like if you're a Mormon uh, and you leave, you don't know how to order coffee. Yes, You've never been yeah. allowed to drink it or think about it. You stand in Starbucks like I did and you go, I want a fettuccine Alfredo, I think. <laughs> no, that's not right. <laughs> I love it. Really? And, and it's because yes. I, I sense it in your organization and ours too, the idea of keeping you in an infantilized state, you know, yes. very young, even as an adult. Um, in the documentary, they showed grown women talking in that very soft voice. Yep. We have that in the LDS church too. Mm -hmm. And it is so disturbing, but it's the complete way of just keeping you, you're, you're not a grown up at all. You're a child yes. and it has to do with that authority 
umbrella. So, mm -hmm. and, and some of the other parallels, I think Landon and I talked before about before, of course, as you're being raised in that way, is just the overall shame of, of anything normal, normal development, normal things that happen as a child, as a young adult, you know, just, just the complete shame. I wonder if either of you could talk about that a little bit. I know it's a really rough topic, but I think more than ever, that's what we hear. I think Landon would agree in the post-Mormon, just how to recover from that because it's just embedded in you as you try to move forward, like you describe Lindsay. Yeah. Chad? So, you know, being a preacher's kid on top of being an IPLP, uh, shame was something that was just part of day-to-day -day life for me because not only did I have to put up a good front, you know, being the cream of the crop in IBLP and this fine, shiny example of homeschooling to the entire world and everything, though we had to keep it quiet because we didn't want to attract too much attention. CPS could show up, which they very darn well should have. Um, so yeah, you had to be a good example, but you also had to be very quiet, you know, about what exactly you were doing. And you had to know who to play what in front of whom. And also you had to be really good in front of everybody in the church. Otherwise dad could lose his job and have to go Go, uh, work at Walmart and you don't want to have to split a McDonald's hamburger four ways do you as uh, with the rest of your family no you don't okay like all this is put on you like my dad literally told me that his livelihood depended on my behavior wow. and I learned very quickly um, early on that I didn't share any of those developmental concerns or anything that uh, made me scared or frightened or anything that didn't make sense to me because whatever I told dad could be a sermon illustration next week. It happened several times. So, um, so, so I know that's not typical for everyone who is an IBLP, but I do feel like there's a bit of a common thread to that because, you know, children's lives were, meant to be used as an example in front of other people. And I'm sure, you know, those of you who have seen Shiny Happy People, you know, the documentary, you saw that poor young kid who, you know, in the yellow shirt who went up and did that demonstration on stage of, you know, spanking. And that was the part in the documentary where I literally had to, you know, I was uh, with our friend Heather Heath and I said, we got to stop. I said, we got to stop. We got to, I need to recover from this for a second because that was too real. Um, you know, stuff like that, J just, it, you know, really hammered home to me in that moment that we as children were, we were just display items. We were not people. Uh, we were there to show the world, you know, what ideal behavior could be. Uh, you saw Josie Duggar, the youngest uh, Duggar kid, you know, just uh, barely able to talk, just chanting that whole line about how instant obedience to the initial promptings of God's spirit. A two-year-old doesn't know what that means, and yet she's, you know, shouting at the top of her lungs. Stuff like that, you know, the idea was complete compliance, complete obedience, and this image of perfection that you had to maintain at all times. When you're a child, children are not known for perfection and for a good reason. One of the things that really was freeing to me in my own development and in my own coming out of uh, fundamentalism was the first time I talked to a counselor and I must have been about 25, 26 years old when I when I first started uh, seeking help for my mental health. Uh, she told me, she said, look, human brains don't really reach full maturity until about your mid 20s. So you're about there. And I was like, wait a minute. I said, that's not what I was taught. Bill Gothard taught that uh, adolescence was a myth. Um, Bill Gothard taught that you basically had to be a mature person by the time you were 13. So you're telling me that, you know, almost twice that is, is how long it takes uh, for, for you to actually get a sense of yourself and everything. She said, yeah, that's just science. You know, we can prove this. There have been studies. And it really hit me in that moment. I was like, wait a minute. I was demanded all that. And I physically could not do that physically, mentally, and otherwise. And that's when things really started to become clearer that I needed help and I never got that help. I was always expected to just know things and, 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 and present that to others and allowing myself to be human and to make the make mistakes. And I still struggle with this to this day. Like my therapist, who I just talked to a couple hours ago, she will tell you that, you know, perfectionism and driving to, you know, always yeah. be at the top of your game are two things I struggle with. But um, realizing that, you know, what we were 
told was the ideal and what we were told was the expected baseline was just too much for our developing young bodies and minds. Uh, that was a huge moment of healing for me personally. I'm so glad that you found someone to talk to because sometimes people on the other side of high demand, high control, uh, can't find somebody that understands, right? What it means. It, and I just thought of another parallel Landon, based on what, what Chad just said in our church, uh, even eight year olds, seven year olds, they're called young men and young women. Yep. That's how they're addressed. Young women, you know, young men that they're doing exactly what they did to you. You're not a young man. You're not a young woman. You're a kid. You're a kid. So well, how old are the, are the ones y'all called elders in Mormonism? Yeah, exactly. You know, that's the thing. It's all, all that hierarchy. No, that that just struck me right there. So, wow, that is incredible. That is just something else. And so with the idea of shame, and then, of course, you have um, what we call in our uh, religion, a purity culture. I'm sure you understand what that is, Lindsay, but especially yep, for the girls and the guys where, mm -hmm. you know, like you say, being on display means you got to you got to be doing it right. You got to dress right. You got to act right. And especially for girls, Lindsay, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that yeah. was like? I'm assuming it's extremely similar and our viewers and listeners can really relate. Yeah, I'm sure that it is. It's and it, and it's it's laid upon you at a very young age. I was saying mm -hmm. to someone recently because I do. Do you guys do purity rings, courtship rings, promise rings, any of that kind of thing? There's you kind called of... emblems of belonging, which are like okay. necklaces and rings and things as you make you know promises to be good as you get older. That okay. kind of thing. So got you. Okay, I know. Couldn't well, be in weirder, right within <laughs> well. Says we, the cult to the other weird cult. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I would say our our closest thing is in, in our church. It was that you had to get married in the temple, and they yeah. taught that. And the only way you could get married in the temple is if you married another mm. active person, right. who, person who, raised who that met way. the requirements yeah, to go. So okay. they would yeah. you, instead and of maybe promising to someone, <laughs> or you you would strive to be in the temple. That was your ultimate goal: to go to the temple mm. and marry someone who was worthy to be in the temple. Right. Be don't date blessed. someone who could not take you to the temple that was in that meant someone who was strictly adhering yeah and if you did not get married in the temple that's a huge devastation to your entire you family slid in right huge. out huge yeah it's Boots just and ladders out nightmare. you go the door <laughs> yeah that's it so yeah gotcha. exactly um with with us it was there i think it's actually within like fundamentalism not just iblp and ati but more fundamentalism and i think um evangelicals do it as well and pentecostals but uh there are promise rings courtship ring purity ring they, they all kind of mean the same thing but um i and i was saying the other day and i know it's a little crude so hopefully i'm not triggering anybody but i feel like when you're as a girl the second you're given a training bra the purity ring shows up and you are pretty instantly like out goes your innocence, out goes your childhood and in comes all of the sandbag weight on your shoulders of your body's about to destroy all men. Um, and it is not good for girls that it is the worst way to enter into the world knowing that everything that is about to happen that is outside of your full control as your body begins to mislumpingly shape itself and you're just like no like every time i had to adjust to different sizes or whatever i'm like no like just just no. stay not yeah. existent please um you're going to be a problem for me um but the purity ring gets slapped on you and the purity ring or promise ring courtship ring is a promise between you and your father that you will allow him to hold on to your heart, which again, just like grosses me out, but he will hold on to your heart and your feelings because women are emotional and you're, a, you're becoming a, a woman. I hate, again, it was like even the word woman for decades, even now still, I'm like, well, I don't like the word because it was very weaponized in a way. Like now this is going to put you in a box. You are a woman and everything you do, you have to be aware that it will cause men to lust or stumble or have all these issues about you. So you're just like a walking caution cone of issues and you, your clothes have to be a certain way. Your hair has to be a certain way. You can't really wear makeup, but hey, if you have acne, cover that up, please you know or if you're a little more unfortunate maybe you should wear some rouge like it was very weird how things would flex as far as your actual physical beauty and appearance um i have really straight hair gothard always uh towed the line of oh you should accept yourself how god made you 
Well, here it is, Bill. Straight pasta, straight hair. But he wanted it to be curly and 1980s fabulous. He liked the and curly hair. Yeah. For those so, of you that have seen the documentary, <laughs> that it was we were the just godly like, oof, what? as I call it. <laughs> godly, jacket to Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> jacket to Jesus. Boom, boom, boom. Um, like he wanted this like crazy curly hair. And, you know, my mom was blessed with the ability to, to perm her hair and her hair stayed permed. Mine did not. It just went flat. And I had to cut it off. And then I felt shame and embarrassment because my hair was short. Um, and again, as you continue to grow, like in the eighties and nineties, it was like, now you have to wear pantyhose because you can't wear, you can't be bare legged. And I'm like, well, why not? I'm hot. You know, like I'm just a practical person. I'm like, but I'm wearing a skirt down to my ankles. Why am I also wearing pantyhose and tights and stuff? This is miserable. And I live in the South, like, ah, uh. um, but it didn't matter. It was all for the glory of God and for the saving of men's sexual drive because what i learned growing up is men could not control themselves yeah. women are emotional and and feeling driven men are all about the little man if you know what i'm saying the little man they're all I about did. the what little was man the phrase Barely. what was the phrase it was the eye trap there was a phrase the eye that traps. I thought was yes eye traps yeah i love that phrase because we have the very same thing you need to watch out. The men can't help the themselves. You're yeah. the one. I mean, I had a, a youth leader bring me into a room alone and tell me I had to do something about my bosoms. I was 14, almost 15. And I yeah. looked like I pretty much look like now. And what what am I yeah. supposed to do? Like you said, what, you know, and he said, the and scouts, it's a man the scouts telling are talking you about them. Yeah. And I'm like, and he also said, he goes, I haven't had to have this talk with my own daughters because they're not oh. like you. And and here, and that's the other thing as a girl, you're like, of course I need to listen to a leader who's telling me something. Mm -hmm. And I'm so mortified that some scouts are talking about me and right. I don't know what to do. You know, and I, I always make that joke to this day, sometimes look in the mirror and go, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do with you. you know, but yes. Still yeah. Such an unhealthy you're like, way. I thought I was and supposed to accept my body I, and it's do it's, no. it's popping out everywhere. And I don't, it's I don't popping out, do. popping you know, out everywhere. Like, it creates a really, really bad um, viewpoint of your body too. Like you yes. get body shaming in yes. in in your own mind. Um, yeah. Like I I hate. Oh, it was so much. I won't go into it all. But I I feel like for as as people got older, especially as women got older, like you're. I know a lot of women, and when I say women, I mean like teenagers and twenty year olds. But like these girls, where they're like curving their shoulders forward to reduce their chest, they're tucking their butt yeah. under so that that's not mm -hmm. sticking out because that's just how yeah. their back sways. Um, and then you're trying to wear like the the biggest potato tent skirt you can so that no one sees that you're like pear shaped or whatever, whatever it might yeah. be. Or if you're a stick and you have absolutely nothing like that for me was everything. I just wanted to be as flat as I could. And right. it created a very bad food eating system for me. I, I didn't become bulimic. Thank goodness. I didn't like actually get a disorder of any kind, but it was everything in my mind. And it wasn't because I wanted to like look great. I wanted to not be looked at. Exactly. Um, invisible. And so you want to disappear. Yeah, That's invisible. exactly it. Cause you yeah. can't win. You're just being you. And someone's telling you, take care of those, get rid of that. So, yeah. and then I never really thought about it. I thought it from the girl's point of view a lot, but then I started thinking about the guy's point of view yeah. being raised like that as a male Chad. I mean, you're told you can't control yourself, Chad. Look at you. You're a monster, right? I was going to say, you like... also have to be in control of, you know, a woman and your child. I mean, the pressure that that is, I, I can't even imagine. Were you, were you, was that taught to you, Chad? Like you're a boy and you cannot control yourself. Yeah. Or is that something us girls were told specifically? Yeah, well, it was, it was a mixture of both. And, you know, I, I do want to all, always like to preface this by saying that, you know, nothing I'm about to say should ever take away from the fact that this, you know, cult was specifically designed to target women and to, uh, and to exploit them and to, you know, specifically harm them. So what I'm about to say is not, oh, you know, we guys had it much worse or as bad. That was never the case, you know, but we still were hurt by this because Gothard poisoned everything. Yeah. So in, in in my experience, what I was taught, and I'll never forget this, um, this was during um, my session of Alert Cadet, which was, if you remember from the documentary, Alert was basically Gothard's military cosplay that he would have young men in the cult do. And we had like a junior version of that for some of the seminars that we attended. And this is in Knoxville, 1997, 
Uh, if you didn't notice about me, I'm not the athletic sort. Okay, <laughs> like I've never had been, I've always had bad knees, even as a child, I was never the outdoorsy type, not very athletically inclined. And so when I'm out there in a little military uniform getting screamed at by a bunch of, uh, you know, older teenage boys, you know, cosplaying Marines and everything, being told I had to do obstacle courses, double time march, do push ups every time I screwed up, you know, it was miserable and I failed at everything I did. So midway through this, it was a three day course. The second day was my birthday, specifically my 12th birthday. My dad took me out. Uh, he skipped a couple of sessions in the afternoon. He took me out to uh, have ice cream there in Knoxville. And I remember him saying, you know, two things in particular. First of all, that the reason I was failing at Alert Cadet was he hadn't trained me to be a man. And he said, this is important. He said, the reason you're failing is, you know, I failed to, you know, bring you into manhood, into spiritual manhood. And if you were more spiritually inclined, if you're stronger in your faith, you would be able to do all these things. He said, because the day will come when, you know, people might show up at your house in guns demanding to know who's a Christian and what are you going to do then? You know, you and your family. <laughs> so exactly. Kind of like so, that. you know, the pilot dies yeah. and you take over the plane. Someone shows up and with a gun and says, <laughs> are you Christian? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's extreme. Yeah. But what about it? Um, that. That's what we're yeah, told. No, it's going to happen. Yeah. Wow. The second thing we the second thing he told me, and this is, you know, we were walking through the malls, we were having this conversation there locally. We walked past the Victoria's Secret display. <laughs> and dad looks at me and he says, Now, son, you know, um, you're getting older now, and uh, you know, you may start to feel certain urges or may start to feel a certain way to look at things you're not supposed to. And if you're ever tempted to do that, let me know. If I'm ever tempted to do that, I'll let you know. How about that? Now, I was 12 years old, very naive, didn't know what sex was, but I knew a trap when it was presented to me. So I was just like, uh-huh. And then I was like, I am never telling this man anything. That is <laughs> you know, a, like, that's like a rat that is, trap. That, just that was, <laughs> exactly. I was just like, there is, there is no way. But he told me, he said, you know, certain things you cannot help seeing and thinking. But, you know, that second look is is the one that you can't help. So he did at least tell me that one. We, we, we had the, that saying in the LDS yeah. as a second missionary. Look. You know, he told you, you know, if you don't look once, you're not a man. If you if you look twice, you're not a missionary. <laughs> oh, yep. <laughs> there you go. Yep. <laughs> Oh my God. So, so, so he did tell me that one, but he didn't tell me anything else. Like we never really had a full on sex talk and I'm just going to be very blunt with how, you know, how the talk went. It was essentially, uh, do not masturbate. I will tell you the rest later to which I was like, thanks for letting me know that was an option. But, um, yeah. but also, uh, but, but what they showed in shiny, happy people was literally the truth. They would give you a guide like on your wedding day and you were supposed to figure it out from there. And that was my, what my dad intended. It never happened. Of course. Now I did find the S volume of the encyclopedia, which was very enlightening, but uh, <laughs> literally that was my sex education growing up. And thankfully I found better sources right. as I grew older and had uh -huh. more access to things. Right. <laughs> But, um, but what, but what we were told, and you know, I had the mild version mostly because my dad was scared to death to tell me anything. What I found out later on was that m many of my peers, you know, who really bought into this whole, you know, be manly Christian, he man, GI Joe, you know, uh, they all, um, that they all kind of went full on into this thought that, you know, they were just some kind of sexual machines that absolutely had to get married as soon as, you know, they were legally allowed to do mm -hmm. so, but, you know, so they could a get started on that whole quiverful thing and then B, you know, um, not have any more problems with lust or whatever. And unfortunately mm -hmm. that, um, that did lead. And I do know some people I grew up with that led to some very sexually abusive behavior um, and, you know, just horrific abuses uh, in their lives after that. So I felt like I was lucky in that I wasn't considered, you know, worthy enough to be given that much attention by my parents. And, you know, I did, I never really desired to have that control over everything. Cause that whole idea that you're the man of the house and you're supposed to lead your family, you're supposed to be a strong leader. I'm like, that sounds like a lot of work. I mean, I'm like, I, I have a computer. I like that. You know, that's, that's cool. Can I just do that? So not yeah. righteous. 
Come on. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that was the thing. I was just like, yeah, yes, I want to have a family. I want to have a wife and everything at some point, but I don't want to have all this, you know, added idea of responsibility that, you know, is right. supposed to be, you know, the world is now up to me and I have to stand before God and give an account of every single thing that happens with my mm -hmm. family. I'm like that, that, that sounded like, you know, something I didn't sign up for. And I questioned even early on, I was like, cause I, I had friends of mine who were, you know, uh, girls and, you know, young women growing up and everything who, you know, they, they were very, um, they were in IBLP, but they were like very strong, very capable uh, somewhere on a farm. Uh, and they would get out there and they would like wrestle goats and cows and everything much better than I ever could. And I'm like, you know, so why exactly arbitrarily is, you know, am I supposed to be stronger and like more of a leader than them? They're better at this stuff than I am. So I, I don't get it. But um yeah, it was one of those things that, uh, yeah, I, it, it just, the people who didn't buy into it, they were treated as like second class, um, mm -hmm. young men and everything. And the people who did buy into it became abusive jerks. So it yeah. was, it was bad. It was like a yeah, one size another... force all instead of one exactly. size fitting all. It's like you're forced to do it forced. or you're the odd person, you yeah, know, like, well, we'll like just kind of phrase... dismiss them. <laughs> The phrase that I also picked up out of the documentary is when you talked about or performing your gender, meaning yeah. exactly mm -hmm. kind of what you said. You may be able to wrestle a goat, but you can't. You got to stand on the umbrella underneath this other person who doesn't even necessarily want to be there. So it mm -hmm. does. It makes it a very sexist, you know, I love that phrase, perform your gender, because we have that too from very young on we have songs that make sure the girls understand they're going to be a mommy. The dad, the boys understand yeah. they're going to hold a briefcase. You know, it's very uh performative like that so don't you agree yeah. landon i mean you probably remember that too it's oh yeah it's absolutely you had your gender roles and there was no yeah. deviating from them uh, even mm -hmm. still today in the church uh you, you know but they're eternal right. we're told they're That's eternal right. like there's yeah. no changing you were that way before you were born you're that way now and you will be that way again you no deviation whatsoever and yeah, it's sad because why try yeah <laughs> for whoever you are yeah i mean that's how i exactly. felt i'm like then why try why am I going to yeah. fight it? Why? I mean, I still couldn't help it. Sometimes I had a willful spirit, but like, why, why try? <laughs> why bother? Because like you, you've already told me exactly what my whole future is. Like I was asked recently, yeah. did I, did I dream daydream a lot as a kid? And I'm like, are you kidding? I already, why torture myself? Like, I think from like the age of eight, I was a realist. I'm like, why am I going to torture myself with the thought of like having like a really cool place to live or going overseas and going to cool beaches? Like, no, I was going to have mm. to get married to someone I probably didn't like, deal with all the grown up stuff that somehow makes a baby. I don't know how that works. And then I'm going to have to homeschool kids, which I don't even like being homeschooled. So I'm going to have to do it for them and ew. And then what? Now I'm like a spiritual old lady that sits at church where all the young ones come and talk to me. I'm like, woo. My life was not That's going it. to be exciting at all. It was mapped out. There was no dreaming from the beginning. So nope. Yeah, oh, there was no dreaming. Oh, maybe I didn't dream the title of the episode, Landon. I there was no dreaming. Poignant. There were no dreaming. <laughs> there were no well, dreaming. Well, and then, <laughs> and then of course the part that really resonated, although this is the darker side of it, you know, you talk about all the shame and the focus on your bodies and then, you know, what we saw in the documentary is what happens in the LDS church. We have one-on-one -on -one interviews with men as young people. And that's as disturbing for boys as girls. And I've told the story before that when I was 12, again, they're obsessed with masturbation. And, you know, they asked me, do you do that? I don't know what that is. And I was kind of like, ah, oh. so they had to tell me what it was so I could tell them if I did it or not, you know, went home to the dictionary, not encyclopedia, tried to look, you know, everything up about it. But, you know, just these very invasive, <laughs> very inappropriate, inappropriate, very damaging, you know, yeah. and you look Lindsay had some experiences that were even more extreme than that with with leadership uh, and yeah. so inappropriate. I don't know if you want to in yeah. general talk about that, or, but that I think it. resonated with with a lot of uh, post Mormons because a lot of us just that culture where you stop and drop and talk to any leader at any given yeah. time in a closed room. You have to say everything. You would never dream not they can ask you anything, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. that's just what you do. You don't know any other way, and that leads to terrible abuses. It's conditioned compliance. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you just, you just simply know this is where Mm -hmm. I have to be honest. I can't Mm -hmm. really lie. Although I definitely hold fast to women, especially in IBLP became master manipulators pretty quickly. I think even, even the children would, no matter your gender, like we became manipulators, like Chad was saying, like, I realized right then and there, I'm not going to confide in dad when I have weird thoughts, you know, like I, this whole, like promising my heart to my father. And if there was a kid in church, like I remember one of the very first kids, I was like, Oh, is this, I didn't know it was a crush, but I'm like, oh, I really like him. Um, His name was Patrick. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Patrick, you know, I think I was maybe 10, 11, maybe. But even that, I was like, I am not going to tell my dad, like, hey, I like kind of like Patrick because I didn't know what would happen with that. Would I get spanked when I got home? Would I get a two hour talk of purity and and not get all the information still? Because I always, you could always tell when the parents were holding back stuff or they were getting weird about telling you anything that should be normal. Our bodies are normal and they do things. They're function. It's science. They function in, in weird ways and they can be really fun, but not right now. Like I just can only imagine what I would have said to children if I had had kids, like what I would have said to them as they're growing up. And I don't know why our parents became so like all thumbs about it. Like, Oh, my God, don't have to have have sex talk. You're just like, it's not that hard. You do it all the time. So like, figure, (laughs) figure it. Especially if you're quiverful. Right. Exactly. (laughs) All the time. Right. That's the weird juxtaposition, right? The shame, the purity, and yet do this all the time. Oh my God. It's such a hot mess. Exactly. So there's no boundary. There's no boundary to them demanding stuff of you, but you have all the boundaries around yourself. So you can't even, I'm sure as a guy even say like, Hey, my body's being weird when I wake up in the morning. Like you probably would never even say that to your father. Cause you're like, my dad's going to think I'm sinning, you know? Yeah. And then for girls, we are totally different as most people know. And so it's like, I didn't know what any of that was. You know, and like Chad said, like right before my wedding, I was given a book on, you know, here's how to how's how to do the deed. And I'm like, <laughs> like, wait, I don't have very many weeks to get this, like, be OK with this in my brain. You know, and does, does my husband know about this? Does he know about this? <laughs> Say what? Like, you're just having like a panic attack about your honeymoon. And you're like, maybe I don't want to get married. Um But as far as like the inappropriate conversations, I was 18 years old um, and I was not at headquarters yet. Bill Gothard had met me when I, and he's the leader of our cult, but when he met me um, at one of the seminars, he didn't meet me and that I went up and said, Hey, I'm Lindsay. And I'd love to to say hello. And thank you for blessing our lives or whatever, um, which many people did all the time. But uh, he saw me in a breakfast room and came across the room to me and basically was like, well, uh, so good to meet you. And I would love for you to come and have a meeting with me at, at, at my office later. And um, so, you know, I get to his office and his assistant is sitting over in the corner, male assistant. And he he talks about a few things. What's your birth order? Like all the regular weird social things we do within our system. Like what's your birth order? What's your spiritual gift? And how long have you been in ATI? And how many basic and advanced seminars have you gone to? And how many children's institute have you taught? Did you go to Excel? It's like just da 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 And then like, and are you promised to anybody? And I'm like, um, there is a guy back home that's 35 and he's been wanting to court me for over a year now. And he's like, oh, oh no. And I'm thinking, yeah, I know. <laughs> but he was like, oh no, we're going to have to, we're going to have to get rid of that. And I'm thinking, yeah, cause I didn't really want to marry the guy either, but I didn't have any other way out. So of course I'm kind of like, well, whatever dad wants to do, but I hope he'll hurry up because I would just like life to happen to myself and sitting and rotting at home and taking care of my brothers is really freaking boring at this point, And I'm just bored. Um, so I was willing to marry this guy thinking, oh, at least it would be a new life. Isn't that, that's horrible at 17 to 18 years old that I'm thinking like, this is my freedom and my outlet. And I'm really grateful because I just actually yesterday saw where this guy is at and what he's up to. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, did I dodge a bullet? So huge. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so then Bill's like, well, you're going to have to let go of him and release him. And I was like, how do I release him? I'm not even dating him. We're not courting nothing. He's talking to my dad, but you need to release him emotionally because according to Bill, I had emotionally entwined this man into like, I was the seductress and emotion because I have power over emotion. And apparently physically I have all the wicked witch powers. And so I had like brought him in emotionally. And so I had to emotionally release him. So that was going to require a phone call from me. And then the next question was, well, are you a virgin? Which I think his assumption was maybe that I was sleeping with a 35 year old, but I was like, oh. and you were 17 and he I was, was 30. I was 18. Yeah. Well, when he Even started, so, those I was 17. Numbers. He was 35. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Those are, those are, those are not cool numbers. <laughs> Even when I became 35 and I was like 17 year olds, 
what? Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> this it is a very so different young. perspective. Yeah. yeah, very different perspective. But I was also forced to age into adulthood at 13. So th there's a part of me that says, you know what? Like, yes, it was wrong. I am not validating what he was doing. But I can see where that maturity level, and I'm already conditioned to obedience and compliance and joyfully being me. I can see how I was like a freaking firefly to people. Like, ooh, she's so primed for being the perfect candidate for my wife. Like, I don't even have to teach her anything. She already knows how to do it all. So, um, but then his follow-up question was, are you a virgin? And his assistant sitting there, my dad and I had never even had like virginal conversations. It was just obviously an obvious known thing that I was. And so I'm like, <sighs> like, I know the answer is no. But this is very strange that like, why would Bill be asking this? And I I mean, I said, well, yes, uh, of course. But I felt like everything in me just felt like uh, vulnerable and exposed and very shamed, even though I was proud that I was a virgin. I just felt really and I realized now it was just a violation of my own privacy that he was yeah. evading in that question and doing it with like, you know, a single guy like he was not a married man. It was yeah, one of the you other should students point that out. Right. Not yeah. married, no children. That was shocking to me when I finally yeah. realized that in the documentary because he was yeah. he was guiding and insisting that everyone lived their lives this way, something he had never done, had no experience whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Bill was celibate crazy? from what we know. Yeah, but I mean, maybe not celibate's the wrong word, but like he was not married, yeah. did not have children. Um, and I mean, at the time, because I was, I was in the environment. So for me, it, I never really thought to like judge Bill Gothard. Because you were, he was propped up so high and everybody just believed in him so, so deeply that you just kind of go with the flow of it. And I'm like, well, he seems like a good d dude, but like, I don't really understand this question, but you know what? I don't understand anything because I'm not, uh, I'm a kid that was isolated from everything. I was always aware of how much I probably didn't know. Yeah. Like I knew that I was not informed. So I'm just like, well, go with the flow because maybe this is just how it goes as you get older and you get into these things and you're, he wants you to work at headquarters. So he definitely wants to make sure you're not promiscuous. You know, it's like you could just explain it all away in your head. Um, but at the end of the week, uh, we called my parents and they were, oh, yes, we would love for her to go to headquarters. I mean, they didn't even skip a beat. I didn't even go home. I went straight to headquarters with three other girls, which should have been another warning sign. <laughs> the three other strays that he picked up at the seminar. Chad we wasn't invited to headquarters? Unfortunately. Yeah, Chad, come on. <laughs> Chad, well, Chad, Chad was in Europe and we literally could not afford to send me to headquarters. So there we were missionaries go. at that point. Yeah. <laughs> my goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I need to deal with my cat for five seconds. Oh, and I'll be yes, right I understand so that sorry. the animals. No, it's fine. Take a break, Lindsay, for the cat. I've been dealing with my dog. So so your family went on a mission, Chad, from uh, yes. they did. OK, what what's that about? I guess I didn't realize from the documentary that missionaries went out. That's yeah, kind I of didn't fascinating. Know that either. Yeah, we um, so basically my my folks had been missionaries to the Netherlands and Belgium before I was born. And um, they, my dad started losing his hearing, so he uh, pastored a military work in England so he wouldn't have to learn another language. And that is where I was born until I was 10 months old. We lived there, and then we moved back to Alabama, and I lost my accent. But uh, <laughs> as far as, you know, England went. And, uh, but then, you know, dad decided uh, after hearing aid technology got better in the 90s, uh, he decided to try again in the Netherlands and Belgium. So when, uh, after... Uh, the ATI conference in uh, 97, uh, that December, uh, we went back over to the Netherlands and Belgium, and I lived there until I was 19. We took some trips back and forth to the States and everything uh, from time to time, but largely I was over there and we were missionaries. Um, they kept me in the uh, ATI homeschooling curriculum. And we did have two other families who lived over there who also followed ATI that we mostly hung out with. So, yeah, we even overseas, because this thing had a reach all literally all around the world. Uh, you know, you, you were never too far away from, you know, the influence of Bill Gothard. How, how does that work? Who paid for the mission? Did did your dad get paid to be there? In, in Mormondom, you don't get paid for a mission. You pay your own way. Pay for um, your own, yeah. So uh, did you get paid or your dad get yeah. paid? And, and is it the church or I'd be... LP or who? Well, this was actually more of a more of an artifact of the uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. So the way it works in the IFB, 
Like, if it were the Southern Baptist Convention, you would most likely get paid by the convention itself after you're approved to be a missionary. But in the uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, you had to go to church to church around the country and, you know, you know, get them to pledge, say, like anywhere from 15 to $100 a month from that church to support you on the mission field. And once you had enough, you would go over and you would live uh, overseas in the mission field and try to start churches. That was that was my dad's plan. He wanted to start independent fundamental Baptist churches in the Netherlands and Belgium, which went about as well as you think it would. American fundamentalism <laughs> does not play well in Europe, I'm just saying, especially in two of the most affluent countries too. in the world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I very figured y'all right? They're just like, yeah. no, we're yeah. not going to do this. So yeah. that or is, even if they that, do go to church, they don't do that. You know? yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's exactly right. You know, one part of the documentary I found fascinating, and we didn't have a chance to talk about it when we were on Mormon Stories, is the whole concept of the Christian activism. Like, yep. that is huge. The, the mm-hmm. children are being homeschooled to be Christian act. I mean, talk a little bit about that. I think that is maybe one of the more disturbing parts as you see what their really, what their agenda really is. And social media is making it so much easier for that outreach too. Go ahead. Yeah. I was saying that, that Joshua generation that they talked about, I was briefly part of that. Uh, and you know, I I think it's important to also clarify because they didn't have a lot of time in that episode, but it's also important to clarify that the Joshua generation was just one Avenue that, you know, people who grew up in IBLP and in Christian homeschooling in general had to try to influence the government. There were several, but that was one of the more popular ones. So the idea, IBLP's idea would, that would be that you would go and, you know, try to get a further education by working for them at their training centers or at headquarters. But there were other uh, institutions like Patrick Henry College in Percival, Virginia. That was a college that was started specifically for Christian homeschoolers. They only have one major government and you would go there and they would, you know, try to indoctrinate you into their idea of constitutional law and, and, you know, how to be a political activist, how to run for office and stuff. And then they would place you, uh, working in, at Capitol Hill as staffers in some of these uh, uh, politicians' uh, offices and stuff, and it was very effective. Uh, like they said, um, Madison Cawthorn, uh, he was probably one of the uh, biggest products of that entire movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joshua Generation encompassed Patrick Henry College and a few other you know, uh, side groups and everything, but they were all united in this vision that they would flood uh, Washington with all these young homeschooled minds. I myself went to Patrick Henry College's very first teen camps. I flew in from Belgium, uh, June 2001. I went to two teen camps. One was about constitutional law. We had to do moot court. We had to pretend like we were standing in front of the Supreme Court arguing cases and everything. Other kids got to go to space camp. I'm 16 and I'm <laughs> I'm pretending like I know what the hell I'm doing uh, when it comes to constitutional law. So, uh, so there was that. And then the second week was journalism and how to, you know, use the um, use the tools of journalism to really spread like a you know deeply far right agenda. And I took that to heart. Like I actually formed a website with some uh, some of my fellow uh, classmates and everything. When I got back to Belgium, uh, we all connected. This is about the time AOL Instant Messenger started, and we started like trying to make plans to make these websites to further these political ideals. You know that of course we at sixteen, seventeen, or whatever totally knew how the world worked, and we're going to try to make America great again through. So that was um, that was the stated goal. Like. Those of us who grew up thinking that we were going to change the world for Jesus thought that we saw, you know, these opportunities come up specifically for us. And, oh, it must be God's will because it's all falling into place. And it took me um, probably about uh, three or four years of being mugged by reality when I got out into the real world and understood, like, you know, how things worked and not just from the comfort of my homeschool existence to be like, oh, things are more complicated than it seemed mm. from my little perch. Mm. So, yeah, it, the, the world itself quickly disabused me of the notion that I had all the answers. But unfortunately, there were some, you know, golden children who were carried on these pillows and everything who are now in very influential parts of government now that, um, you know, that's 
they they made what was a fringe homeschooling problem everybody's problem and that's what i think if nobody else if nothing else you walk away from shiny happy people knowing that there are people who are entwined with all this they're still trying to make a difference and that they're still trying to influence the state of the world and that's why it's important to suss out everything that iblp touched and everything that this brand of fundamentalism had an influence over and rid ourselves of it once and for all that's yep. like a mic drop do you have a mic that you can just drop right now and just down it, it would make some noise if i dropped that <laughs> <laughs> like boom no that's why i found that so fascinating i mean did they were the girls Lindsay, also equally like encouraged to go out i remember there was one scene i can't remember which of which of you it was where it showed you know you were sent out to capitol hill to just kind of like follow uh, leadership around and say hey vote this way or you know and they're like oh what a nice young woman look you're so knowledgeable and you're dressed you know so yeah, that's conservatively. a good question and since you were supposed to stay under the umbrella were you allowed to be a page or to be in the in that same? my my viewpoint on it first of all i am not joshua generation because i got I, I mean i'm much older than the joshua generation and i was removed in 2000 is when i got married and i really left the system if you will so even for me i'd heard of the joshua generation and then seeing it in the documentary i was like oh yeah no that tracks i see i i didn't know that was the name of all these people but i've been you know seeing all these little critters out here trying to do all this stuff but um, I think for for women in the way that in the 80s and 90s, yeah, you're very right. Like our place was at home. And if you were a woman in IBLP and ATI, then you were learning the womanly arts. You were going to learn how to cook and sew and uh, teaching the children. You're probably parentification is thrust on you. And so you're you're watching all the children your mother is having because, you know, she doesn't have time. She's continuing to pop out babies and please the father. And so that if you were lucky enough, like myself, where I didn't have younger kids at home, um, the only way with an ATI that you could go and do something as a woman is if it was within the ministry. Like that seemed to be the only way that Bill was like, it's okay if you're a young lady in the ministry, but I don't want you working anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, he fit the rules to, to bless him. And so I, that's how I got to work at headquarters because by all accounts, by his words and all, all the things I knew at that point, you should just be at home waiting for, you know, Prince Charming to show up. So I was lucky that he took a liking to me and I was able to escape my home and actually work at headquarters. Now, the interesting thing is when I left headquarters, there was an opportunity that opened up one of the guys at headquarters and one of my really good friends actually were looking into leaving headquarters and going and working in DC for David Barton's company, which I always blank on and Chad always knows what it is. Wall right. builders. Wall builders. There you go. So I was offered a potential opportunity at 21 to go to DC house with, uh, with them, which I was like, my dad is never going to go for that. I can't house with a guy, but I could house with this other girlfriend. And sure enough, my dad's reply was, you have many more years of service for the Lord. And I'm like, okay, then send me to DC. But not that. <laughs> it was always like, there's many more years of single service for the Lord. But I don't know what that is. And it's definitely not that. So you, you're just constantly hitting a wall as a young lady in this program. You're just like, give me something. And then, nope, you can't have nothing. <laughs> Um, so I think that as into the 2000s and like 20 aughts, 20 teens, I started noticing that like even with the Duggar family, like the girls do not wear skirts down to their ankles. I would have been completely whipped if I had worn a skirt to my knee. Like when I when I when I started like do not watch the show, but someone was like, oh, you should peek in because I, I really actually think that this is how you were raised. And I watched like, I don't know, five seconds of it. I'm like, no, 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 no. I've been here, done this, lived it. But the skirt length, I was like, oh, that's curious. And that's really weird. That's not mod modest by the IBLP standards I was raised with. And then, you know, the way they wear T-shirts or just the fact that their hair is just kind of like limpy, not fluffed up curls. I'm like, this is not my ATI. Like, I don't know what this is. And now even the family camps, like girls are wearing shorts with like maybe a knee top legging or a knee length legging and things like that. And I'm like, I am so confused. Also happy because at least they're wearing things that are a little more, I don't know, modern and not so overbearing. But um, I think that things got even laxer with like social media. Um, the fact that the Duggars were even on TV, I was stunned. And I wasn't trying to at the time. I, actually, I'm going to say this. I didn't know how to, what victim like I didn't know to victim shame or not. But I was just like, wait a minute. Why? 
why are they even allowed to do this? Like my question was, Bill would never allow this because he doesn't like TV. You, you have to kick the TVs out of your home. He also doesn't like this, like everything being so public. Like he kind of likes to lurk in the shadows and really like massage the family from within. And now he's like, yeah, go, go on TV. I was like, they had to have gotten his permission. They, there had to have been a conversation at some point for them to be okayed and greenlit to be on TV. I guarantee it. Um, but I, again, I was just still so shocked with even like some of the topics or the way that it was filmed or even some of the music that was overlaid. And yet every now and then you would see like a little blip of a wisdom booklet. And you're like, mm, that's interesting. Or they'd have like the IBLP going to ATI conference. And you're like, right. Oh, weird. So anyway, all that was really strange to me too, but I think social media and I just think the progression of time, you know, Christians are always, and I'm sure a lot of other religions are always going to flow to where all of the eyes are. And if nobody's, nobody's listening to seminars anymore, he doesn't do seminars in person. No one's going to them. You've got to go to where people are listening and watching. And so I think that he was just, you know, making the next excuse and, um, opening up the box of like, well, let's broaden the horizon a little. I know we shouldn't be doing TV, but hey, if it can reach more people, then that's what we're about now. Can I, can I, I have right. one thing? Can I, can I have one thing about the Joshua generation uh, no. thing as far as you women go? Chat. Not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love all these names I have to say, though, because it's so Mormon, too. We have mm. like Sons of Helaman. I mean, you, 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 we just have a, the same acronyms, so, so acronym funny. heavy, the same kind of names. You know, it means the same thing. I just we, we are kindred spirits. I'm not kidding. <laughs> go ahead, Chad. <laughs> Yeah. When you asked that question, it brought two things to mind. I had not thought about these in years. But, um, you know, one thing that uh, I thought when I first went to Patrick Henry College for their teen camps, that I thought was very, like, a little bit more mainstream than I was used to was the fact that they were actively encouraging women to, you know, seek uh, jobs in government and in politics and stuff, mm -hmm. at least according to the camp and the face that they were putting forward. Uh, but digging into it, I found out that, you know, anyone in, in, in relationships were definitely encouraged because in fundamentalism in general, you know, you were encouraged to find your mate at college. You know, there were jokes about, you know, women going for their MRS degree and stuff. And that was definitely <laughs> the case there. But yeah. even but even in the supposed college where there was more freedom for women to pursue their interests, you know, any relationships uh, in the college had to be accompanied by a by a letter from both sets of parents uh, to the faculty saying that the parents uh, approved of the relationship that this that these adult students were in. So that was one thing. Another thing was, you know, the reason that we knew about this was we considered having this as part of our discussion site for former campers and everything uh, growing up because me and several administrators, we had formed this little group site uh, back when online forums were like really a thing. And uh, we had online discussion forums where we actually had one of these young women um, volunteer to be one of our moderators and that was fine but she had a stipulation if we as the administrators because we were all male if we had to talk to her about anything we had to schedule it at a time where she could get on instant messenger with us and her dad could be present because she was not allowed to talk directly to any men on the internet even if it was like you know for like a volunteer job like we were doing so wow. it was so even with that supposed, you know, veneer of freedom and everything, there was still always that ever present, you know, control that, you know, these that these people who are so ingrained in the system tried to maintain. And it was yeah. uh, even though things loosened, there was still, you know, the, the basic concepts are, were still there ever present. And even if you okay. didn't have if you didn't have that over mm -hmm. you, you still self-policed. Yep. So even if you didn't, you know, if you didn't have your father there, if something was weird or off, which, you know, I'm sure was because you're hyper vigilant at this point, you would, re you know, you'd report it back to your father or whoever your authority was at the time. You just, you just mm -hmm. instinctively knew, well, got to go and tell him that guy was weird. Yeah. You were under the umbrella and there was no way out. So let me ask you, Landon, if you have any further questions, otherwise I think we're going to get to kind of our last, um, section I wanted to cover, which is going forward and what we're doing now. So do you have any other final follow-ups for these? We could literally talk to you for hours. I know we could, because I do. <laughs> oh, I feel like we're kindred spirits. Part two, three, like, four, oh, and you five. you too, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
the the uh, teachings, that was one of the things that concerned me too when I saw how politically active they were and how active they actually were, effective they were in changing national policy because there were so many people in this group. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was scary uh, to see that this... Uh, you're 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 a lot bigger than how many how many million are in the iblp I'm, i mean it's bigger than i i mean i think i don't think that anyone has an actual accurate number bill has touted out that it's been over 2.5 million or something like that at one point i think it was 3 million then it seemed walked back a little bit um but there there's like let's say 3 million at most um with iblp and that would encompass ati as well i believe and then it's it's more the fact that what he was teaching was then being taken back into churches. So and then and then you know what I'm saying? So like not everybody yeah. would attend the seminar because they were expensive. And if you did not have a lot of money, you would just wait until it came to your church or people brought back materials, copied them and handed them out. Let's be real. Even though it had copyrights, people were copying them left and right. Um, and then it would become a part of the church. I was saying the other day that if you if you just type in uh, 49 character qualities not, but you don't have to type in Bill Gothard or IBLP at all, but 49 character qualities into Google, the amount of churches that come up that have his 49 character qualities listed on their websites without his name, without a kickback to IBLP or ATI, it is astounding. And it's just that within fundamentalism and in Christianity as a whole, this resonated with everybody. And you don't have to do any work because someone already did it for you. So this is really deeply entrenched. And then you have the umbrella. I can't tell you how many people since the documentary came out said, oh, my God, I know this. This was in my church. This was in my home. I didn't even know this. I didn't even wasn't even a Christian. And like yeah. my parents brought home this paper one time and we had it on our pin board. And I'm like, what? You know, so it really had it just it. I think it took a lot of hold because it was patriarchal and it gave yeah. parents their authority back and like kids sit and submit. And then the church got their power back because like, look, I can just point to this and this is godly. But where is the reference point for this at all? Where's the grace in it? Where is the understanding? Where's the support system? Like, it's just freaking umbrellas for goodness sake. You know, it's, it's freaking weird. umbrellas. There's our title freaking landing. Umbrellas. There's so many things we could make this thumbnail <laughs> called. It's freaking. I love umbrellas. making I titles. Think that's the answer. You're good. You're good at the catchphrase. Also, drop All your right. mic, Lindsay. Good job. <laughs> and, another <laughs> dropping the mic moment. Okay, this is we great. need to get and foam mics, Chad, so we can just drop a foam mic. Seriously, every couple, you know, with that sound. So, okay. Well, as we finish up here, I would just, you know, the wonderful thing about Chad and Lindsay is that they didn't just, you know, sort of fade away from this. They are activists. They are are helping others. They are sharing their story. They are a safe space for people, not yes. only in their organization, but anyone who has left something high demand, high control and thinks, am I crazy? Does anyone understand me? Yes. Chad and Lindsay understand you. So why don't we, uh, Chad first and then Lindsay, talk about what you're doing now. Um, who are you talking to? Who are you working with? How, what's your mission going forward? Because that's what's beautiful, I think, about both of you and just wonderful. Mm. The mission, as it always has been from the first time I booted up TikTok and told my story, is to take IVLP down. I make no bones about it. Like, I want IVLP gone. Like, I, I, I even told, like, the directors and producers at one point, I was like, I'm serious. Like, you know, I, I believe in the documentary and the work we're doing. But documentary aside, you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get IVLP to go away. And so to this day, I'm still sharing my story. I'm still talking to others and I'm encouraging people to share their stories on whatever platform makes mm -hmm. sense to them. Uh, what I said at the end of the, uh, of the docu-series, uh, I take very seriously. All we have to do is talk. And I'm not saying that it's easy. I definitely want to clarify. It's not easy to just talk, but it is the most effective weapon that we have against these teachings, against Bill Gothard, against IBLP. It's the one thing that has been proven to work. Whenever we talk, IBLP runs. We got to mm -hmm. keep them running until they can't run anymore and they collapse under their own weight. So that's been my focus and also reaching out to other survivors, comparing stories, encouraging them to share theirs. And I am not saying that, you know, I'm some powerhouse doing this. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. And one of the biggest giants in that is sitting right next to me on the Zoom call because 
Lindsay has been such an inspiration to me personally. I, I'm not even kidding. When 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 we found each other on TikTok, I looked through our archives and I was just floored. I was like, she has been doing the damn work. And seeing that and seeing so many people, especially now being willing to share, keeps me going. And that is what I consider to be, you know, what where I'm at moving forward. Oh, that's wonderful, Chad. Thanks for sharing that. Jenny. Love you, friend. <laughs> we are docu siblings, but we were siblings way before it, I think. <laughs> My maiden name is also his last name. And so I was like, I swear there's somewhere in our lineage. We're we Mormons siblings. will do your genealogy. We'll find it. There you go. <laughs> um, I also want to um piggyback off what Chad said as far as like IBLP. They have rebranded quite a bit and they're on the way to really, I th I think kicking out IBLP as their acronym completely at some point. They are now known as the Home Discipleship Network. And then they have Founding Faith something or others. Um, all you have to do if you're not sure, if it smells a little funny, first of all, you can just send it to Chatterai and we'll let you know if it's IBLP or not. But if you scroll to the very bottom of the websites, you might see like a ministry of IBLP. Like, and it's usually like just a slight contrast to the color right behind it. You know, it's like it's black, but then it's kind of grayish. And you're like, well, okay, I'll see you for what you're doing. But they have a podcast as well. Um, I don't, I don't like naming them, but I'm also like, I think they should be named because I think people should know like uh, Commands of Christ is their podcast. Like just steer clear, man. Um, and then what is the other one, Chad? Is there one other one? I think it's just Home uh... Depot, oh, Embassy Media is oh, yeah. the other one that they have. And that's where all of their videos and stuff are. Um, and then I think on the Home Discipleship Network is where when they do their family camps, they actually do them, they'll stream them live out there as well, um, which I watched the last um, one that they did for an entire week. Chad and I were texting back and forth as we're like being completely traumatized and shocked by the stuff that's being said now. Um, it's even worse, like 10 times worse what these people are saying. It's I even I, I couldn't believe how on the floor my jaw was. I'm like, I cannot go any further than the floor. Um, but as far as um, what I'm doing now, I first would just say therapy, therapy and more yes. therapy, trauma informed therapy, not just talk therapy, family therapy, better help. Sorry, guys, better help is not the help uh, that you need. Sorry, better help. But um, you need to be with trauma informed therapists. And I know for some people that are still in religions, they want to find a therapist that is within their religion, especially within Christianity. They want Christian counselors. And I'm just here to tell you, Christian counselors do not have a degree. Christian counselor, I could be a Christian counselor today. Chad could be a Christian counselor. There is no barrier to entry to, to Christian counseling. You know the Bible, you know some information, you're an inspirational human being, you're a Christian counselor. Um, you need to have you need to go to a therapist that is trauma informed and licensed. There is a barrier to entry and there's a lot of education on your psychology and emotions and your nervous system. And I have benefited greatly from two years of EMDR therapy, which has really helped me to uh, fast track, if you will, through my therapy, because I know a lot of people that have been through these type of traumas and abuses and they're like 10 years in going, I'm still no further. Like I've had people ask me questions from the documentary, like, oh, I've been in therapy for a really long time. And I just, I'm still having these issues. And I'm like, is it a trauma informed therapist? What is the bra What is, what is the clarification or classification of your therapist? And they're like, oh, I never thought about that. And then they would come back to me and say, oh, it's like a family therapy thing. And I'm like, you need to find trauma informed. There is such a huge difference, but people don't know. Um, and then for me with anxiety, I have a lot of anxiety obviously from high performance and perfectionism and all this kind of stuff uh, thrust on me. I use a breathing necklace, which I know in the documentary, everybody thought was a vibrator. <laughs> it is not a vibrator. We were hoping. It, it, I know everybody was, and I'm like, no vibrating shame, but I do not have the balls to do that. I'm just telling you, literally, I don't. That's but reclaiming I would not... it if you're wearing your vibrator around your neck. I mean, that's like, it's I just, mean, ah, hear me roar. But it's a breathing tool. And then I have, I have these guys as well, which are, um, they're bracelets that do haptics back and forth. So if you've ever done EMDR therapy, which incorporates bilateral tapping movements or eye mov movements, um, that bilateral tapping will allow your brain to stay in a neutral space instead of hitting fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. So you're able to go back into the traumatic memories and work through them without them triggering a shutdown response. Now, is it 
it feels like clockwork orange. Your eyes are like, <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm dealing with the therapy, but you're actually hitting it head on. And I'm telling you, I have had some really hard sessions. Maybe, maybe one situation takes me three weeks, you know, one therapy session a week, but like, will take me three or four weeks to get through. But when I'm done, I'm actually done. Like I have, I have locked it away. I've put it in another place and I feel like I'm aware that it happened. It's not like brain erasure. Um, but I have, I'm able to look at it and talk about my traumas and not carry the past of like all of the traumatic weight of it. Now I can use it as a tool to try to help others. So these are by tap B I dash T A P P. <laughs> and they're, they have been a lifesaver to me too, to just regulate me when I'm traveling or I have that, that physical heightened sensation of anxiety. It keeps me grounded so that because I need the physical modalities because some of the the abuse is actually housed within my nervous system it's not about my brain anymore I mean it is but it's not the conscious brain um so anyway there's I could talk for hours about therapy but that that is my biggest why I advocate the most for that if you really want to heal from this, you cannot do it from just reading some self-help books by yourself, talking to your friends. It will make you feel good in the moment, but it is not addressing the actual core issues that you have. That is very important to hear, I think, because a lot of us do, you know, we limp along like that for a while, yeah. you know, and then eventually you go, there's something inside that I'm just not feeling feeling great. So, and, and I'd like to bring up, there's a, there's an organization called recovering from religion. Yes. Um, yes. Our friend, Dr. Gerald Ray, who we absolutely love. And if you're one of their greatest services, I think is to help connect people to therapists Beautiful. who are not associated with any kind of religion. They yes. vet these people and, you know, no matter where you are, you can go on this website and you can find it there. You can even just chat with somebody. Love it doesn't that. matter what you're mm -hmm. recovering from. And, and he's incredible. They do a great work. So that's called recovering from religion religion. And, and again, everyone, what Lindsay's saying, what Chad is saying, I know this resonates with all of you because it resonates with me. It's resonating with Landon. So seek these guys out, go find them. We're going to put all their social media handles in our show notes because these guys get it. They have been there. They have been through probably rougher things than, than a lot of us, um, just in their, their very concentrated organization that they were in. So that's why I just wanted to do this interview so bad. Don't you feel Landon, just to connect everybody to this that's group right. and these resources. Yeah. The, you guys have been great. Uh, it's it's yeah. been fun chatting with you because it, we're so similar in what we, what we've yeah. gone through and, and the recovery is, is very similar as well. Mm. Yep, it is. So there are tools everywhere. So, Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you so much, Chad. You're amazing. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Amazing. Um, everybody, please comment. Uh, let us know what you think. Let us know if you recognize the parallels, if if Chad and Lindsay and their story resonates with you like it does with us. And please go seek them out. I mean, don't go to their house, but find them on social media. <laughs> I love talking to everybody. <laughs> you can tell that they're very accessible and very friendly. And, and I feel like they're motivated, like all of us are, to just help us all get through this. We can all relate. So um, please like and subscribe to Mormonish. And if you'd like to be notified uh, when a new episode comes out, go ahead and hit that notification bell. And if you would like to help uh, financially support the channel, we finally figured out how to allow people to do that. We have links to PayPal and, and Venmo in our show notes. And again, just everybody healing is what it's all about and we're all in it together and i think we can all help each other so thank you again chad thank you Lindsay. thank you landon and we'll sign off for another episode of mormonish thanks everybody thanks for joining us for another episode of mormonish we really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share you can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com you can also find us on facebook instagram and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.